Well, this evening, uh, you know the number to text questions to. We're gonna continue our study of the book of Nehemiah. I've told you to think about this little book as uh, a, Nehemiah lived, we'll talk about this in a second, but he lived about 2,500 years ago. But it's a very modern story. And it's a story of someone who, through great leadership, achieved something that is really, even today, this would be an amazing achievement. So what happened then is a model of leadership as well as a testament to faith. And so I can't think of a better leadership biography to read than one like Nehemiah. So that's what we're studying. We wanna study the circumstances and we wanna also take a look at the elements of leadership that transfer to us in our lives and in our times as well. So let me start with uh, where we are. And this is the ancient world at the time of Nehemiah, so think 500 BC. And the green area there is the Persian Empire. So let me kind of mark this off. Okay, these boundaries aren't even slightly accurate, okay? But this is modern day Turkey. This is modern day Iraq. And around this area is modern day Iran. And so the Persian Empire at Susa and Persepolis were two great headquarters, if you will, for the Persian Empire. And so they look how much of the world that they conquered. It was a vast, vast empire of, at the time. And this is the political and geographic setting into which our story comes. What has happened, I'll show you a timeline in a, in a moment, but basically the Jews in Israel, it's a tiny part of this map, were conquered, I'm really shortening this story, but they were conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Think Iraq, an empire based in Iraq. And they deported the Jews and spread them all over Iraq, Iran, Turkey. I mean, they spread them over that northern part of the land. And that happened in 586 BC. And they destroyed the temple of the Jews and they just tore down the walls of Jerusalem and they kind of made it uninhabitable. And they, the Jewish people, they intended for them to cease to exist as a coherent group of people, certainly cease to exist as a country and cease to exist as a coherent group of people. Well, the Babylonians were overthrown and this is all historical. This is in your Bible, but this is well, well, well attested. This is just basic real life history that's happening. And so they're overthrown by the Persian uh, Empire and the armies of Persia in 539 BC. And you can read that story actually in Daniel chapter seven. And it meshes very well with the historical record. And so the Persians conquer this part of the world. And the difference with the Persians is that instead of deporting the people that they conquered, they were very tolerant. Their, their method of governance was very different. They said, look, if you will, can keep your gods, you can keep your religion, you could even keep your little civil magistrates and, and government if you want. You just pay us taxes and don't cause trouble. And we're fine with that. And their theory was that will lead to a more peaceful kingdom. Babylonians said, ship everybody out and mix them all up in the world and that will keep people from rebelling. So different styles of governance, but the, the Persians then, King Cyrus, the king of Persia at that time, said to the Jews, he said, look, I realize all these people have been displaced and you Jews, if you wanna go back to Jerusalem, you're welcome to go back. And so there began several waves of Jews going back. So here's a timeline. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Jews go into exile in 586, Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon in 539. The very next year, he issues an edict, which we have, that says basically the Jews are welcome to go back. And so they begin to migrate from 539 all the way down through this history. Our time gets a little closer into the 400s, and you will remember King Xerxes from history, history, like 300, the Spartans. He's the one that invaded Greece unsuccessfully. He is the husband of Esther in the Bible. That's when that happened, is during his reign, 485 to 465. So that's kind of happening in this time frame. 
And all along this time frame, little by little, Jews are migrating back to uh, the area of what we now call Israel. Well, Artaxerxes, the son of Xerxes, ruled for about 20 years after his father's death. Artaxerxes is the king when Nehemiah, when this story is taking place. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. He is the cupbearer to Artaxerxes. And so the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the prophetic books of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, all happening in this time. And you know, I'm really big on this idea is I want you to, why do you spend so much time on the maps and the timelines? Because I want you to understand, this is not a fairy tale. Once upon a time in a land far away, there was a God and he did this with these people. This is real people in real history and these are real events. And these events are very well attested outside the Bible as well. So this is God working in real events. Why is that important to me that you know that? Because a fairy tale God is a fairy tale God. But a real God working in real people's lives in the past is the real God that's working in your real lives today. And so it's important that our faith is grounded in real history, real people, real events, real politics, real economics. I mean, the same kinds of issues then as today. And the God who was so powerful then is still the God who's so powerful today. So that's why that's important to me. Artaxerxes is an interesting guy. This is a picture of his tomb in Persepolis, which is in modern day Iran. That's one of his palaces. And I'll show you some other pics. Persepolis on this map is right here. And this is just an amazing tomb, just carved into the rock face. It's an amazing sight. There are all kinds of information that you can glean from the tomb. Here is a relief of him uh, as an individual. This is what he looked like. The interesting thing here is this picture that I've put at the bottom with the picture of all these people. You'll read in the captions above and below the names of all these different countries. These are pictures of people from each of those countries and they're all people that Artaxerxes had conquered. So most of the art in that time was actually public relations. You know, it was basically a way, the coins were public relations. They would mint coins, and on the coin would be the head of the king. You might never see the king, but there's his picture on the coin. And you might never know that he conquered someone, but oh my goodness, he's thoughtfully bragged on the back how he conquered the Jews. You know, I mean, in those days, art and buildings and money were public relations. And so you, you can learn a lot, and you can just see there, I'll let you look at the slide, you can see how many different peoples Artaxerxes conquered. So our story opens with this all-powerful king, and he literally is, has no checks on his power. The only way to get rid of Artaxerxes is to assassinate him or uh, for another country to overpower them, right? I mean, there are no laws. There's no constitution. There's nothing he can't do. So if you're going to get rid of him, you want to have to kill him. Now, his father was murdered by the head of his bodyguard. That's your number one way of happening. You've got guys around you that are armed and they turn around and say, I don't like you anymore, I'm gonna kill you. Now, what happened to the head of the bodyguard? Oh, he got killed, of course, and Artaxerxes becomes king. The second best way and the way to do this and not be killed yourself is to poison the king. I mean, this happens all the way up to the modern times, but poisoning rulers was really good because you can make it look kind of like it's natural and it's really hard to figure out who did it. Well, poisoning a king, the key to that is you just gotta find the right person to bribe, right? You have to bribe the cook or the baker or really the guy to bribe would be the cupbearer because he was like the butler and the head of the household and he would taste the king's wine and you know, he would uh, eat some of the macaroni and cheese before it went to the king, you know, whatever. He's the one that made sure, and his life was on the line, by the way, to make sure that nobody got bribed and no one poisoned the king. If you know that no matter what, innocent, guilty, no trial, no nothing, if the king dies, you die. Well, that's a motivator, right? You know, you're not gonna profit from this. And so this is the position that Nehemiah holds. And so we see Nehemiah opening, and in the beginning of, uh, we looked at this last time, but I'll probably read it to you again because I want you to hear this prayer of Nehemiah. His brothers come back from Jerusalem. 
and they bring a terrible report. They say, the walls are in ruins, they've built a little temple, but honestly, all the people around us, we're, we can't defend ourselves, we're, we have no power. I mean, it's a miserable existence there. And so, he says this in Nehemiah chapter one. Nehemiah said, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, and this is interesting, listen, listen to this prayer. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I'm praying to you night and day. I am confessing the sins of the people of Israel. We have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments and the rules that you commanded to your servant Moses. Remember, you commanded Moses that if we were unfaithful, you would scatter us among the peoples. But if we returned to you and kept your commandments, even though we were scattered throughout the whole world, you would bring us back to Israel, to Jerusalem, to the place you had chosen for your name. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. It says, now I was the cupbearer to the king. And so we talked about leadership lessons. And one of the, the first lesson was the idea of prayer. And this is a really different way of thinking about leading any enterprise whatsoever, whether it's a business enterprise, whether it's your family. We talked about the idea of prayer is in effect committing your endeavor to God. Instead of saying, God, I need your help with my plan, it's like, God, you can have this, you can own this, and now do as you will with it. And that's what he's saying. He's, he said, God, this, uh, this is in your hands. It's beyond my ability to do this. Well, let's talk about this idea of prayer for a minute and how he prays and what he prays because what he prays is really important. Notice he doesn't say, I really, really, really would like to have the walls rebuilt in Jerusalem and the people be back together and I would really like it if you would help me with that. He doesn't. He appeals to what he understands of God's will. Let me give you a passage from the New Testament that illustrates this really, really well. James is talking to Christians and he said, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Isn't it this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. He may, this may be hyperbole, but what he's saying is, look, why are there conflicts among you? Why do you not have what you want? He said, basically, it's your lust, it's your passion. You want things for yourself and you can't have it, so you start fighting with everyone else. You covet and you cannot obtain it, so you fight and you quarrel. He says, you know what, has it ever occurred to you that you don't have because you don't ask? That you haven't asked God for it? He said, and you ask and you do not receive, why? Because you ask poorly to spend it on your passions. In other words, God doesn't guarantee you to answer your prayers for what you want, for you. God is sovereign and pursues his will. He loves you like a child, and think about what you know about children. You love your toddler, and you want to say yes. I mean, you're predisposed to say yes, but you're going to say no. You're certainly not going to say yes, you can eat all the candy you want, you can stay up as late as you want, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there are limits. Does that mean you don't love them? Of course not. It means you actually do love them, right? That you're willing to set these boundaries. You're not gonna indulge their appetites, their passions, their sins, if you will. And he's talking to adults and he said, you don't have because you don't ask. You're just trying to do all this by yourself. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask so poorly. You're just asking for your own, to satisfy your own lusts, your own desires. He said, you adulterous people, do you not realize that friendship with the world is enmity toward God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now that's really strong language. But here's the interesting thing, he's talking about prayer. And he's, what he's basically saying is that if you will align your lives with God, then your prayers will be aligned with God and God is able to say yes to your prayers. 
So for example, Nehemiah prays to God and he said, God, I very much have compassion for my fellow Israelites and I want them to be safe and healthy and happy. But God, I know that you do too. He says, I confess to you, we have not been faithful. And what you did is exactly what you said you were going to do. You're not wrong. He said, I confess that to you, but I also know that you promised that if we turned back to you, you would gather us back together. Think prodigal son kind of an idea. And he says, I'm turning my heart back to you and I want to turn my brother's hearts back to you as well. So God, please bless this endeavor. My will and your will are aligned. And so the idea of aligning your prayer with God's purposes is key to the idea of leadership, is let the things that you are leading, and here's a great example, it's less, it's, it's obvious in business as well because there's more to business than making money. There are far more important things going on than just making money. You, I pray for the, the people that I know that are in business, here's my prayer. Lord, make them wildly successful so that you will be glorified. It's not a bad thing for Christians to be, quote, successful in the way of the world as long as it's, I am a Christian and my God is blessing this endeavor, that God gets the glory. There's nothing wrong with that. But a better example would simply be this. What is God's will for your family, for your marriage, for your children, uh, for your grandchildren? What is God's will for them? What does God want for them? I know what you want out of your marriage, and it may be exactly the same thing. I'm not being critical. But what I'm saying is, is stop and ask yourself this question. What does God want in this situation? I ask myself that a lot every day, is when I meet with people, I, I really do try to stop and think, what does God want in this situation? I know what I want in this situation. I want to solve this little problem, or I want this to work out this way, or, I, or whatever it may be. And that's fine. It's, it's not that that's unimportant, but the bigger question is what's God doing here? What, what does God might he want to do? Well, when it comes to something as important as your family or your marriage, you know what God's will is. Read the, his word and he'll tell you. He wants thriving marriages that honor God and draw husbands and wives to be more holy together. What does he want with families? He wants children to grow in the nurture and admonition and knowledge and thriving of the Lord to grow with faith so that you will see your family forever. Not just the length of time here, but for eternity. What We know what God wants for that. Then align your purposes with that and God will answer your prayers. That's what Nehemiah does. He said, look, I, I can't do everything I want to do. And if I'm gonna enlist God, then maybe I ought to be interested in what God wants to do here. So the idea of aligning your prayers with God's purposes. Now here's the catch. I know that sounds really easy and you're like, that makes perfect sense, Terry. What God wants for me is good, that's true. What God wants for your family is good, that's certainly true. He wants you to thrive, so it's not that, oh, I don't think God wants good things for my family. Of course he does. He wants good things for your family, wants good things for your business, wants good things for your relationships. God wants good things for us. So that's not the question. It's like, well, then why don't my prayers align with him if he wants what's best for me? Ah, well, I'll tell you exactly why our prayers don't. It's really hard to give up our agenda, isn't it? It's hard to give up our agenda. Now, you could call that control or the desire to have outcomes the way I want. Well, God, I know what you might do here, but frankly, I need success, or I need a lot of money, or I need fame, or I need fortune, or whatever it may be. We have our own agenda. And here's the essence of that. When you become a follower of Christ, you have to tear up your agenda. And if anybody tells you other than that, they're not telling you the truth. You need to read the New Testament. Is one of the things you give up when you turn to Christ is my selfish agenda. Now, does that mean nothing that you want will ever happen? Of course not. Does that mean that you won't ever have any pleasure in life? It's all gonna be drudgery and slavery? Of course not. But it does mean you don't get to work your own side business, right? If you're gonna join the family business with God, you just need to tear up your agenda and say, you can have my life, you can even have my ambitions, you can have the meaning and purpose of my life. In fact, you can have my business, you can have my family, you can have my marriage. 
Good things happen when you tear up your agenda, and bad things happen when we insist on doing it our way. Well, that's what's happening here, and I want to draw that principle out. What Nehemiah did is he began by praying, and he committed this endeavor to God, and he aligned his prayer with God's will for his people. Question? Yes, this is a follow-up from last week, which is this point. Uh-huh. So, Assuming that God wants you to turn all those things over to him, how do you reconcile that with the idea that then I don't do anything? I don't plan, I don't work, I just sit on my hands and wait for God to do it. That's a great question. And let's see what Nehemiah did after he prayed. So the story continues. That's a, that is a really great question. Uh, so what does Nehemiah then do? Okay, well, let's go to step two. He prays. He commits this endeavor to God. It says, in the month of Nisan, that's a Jewish month, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that's a Persian calendar, when the wine was before him, in other words, it's dinner time, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence before. So, I want to stop here, and one thing you may miss is if you look at chapter 1, verse 1, Basically, when he got that news from Jerusalem, it was, you can, you can tell the exact year and you can tell the exact time of year. And the Jewish month that's mentioned there is November to December. Their, their months don't line up perfectly with ours, but it's November, or December. This month, Nisan in the 20th year of the king is March, April. So even though we just went from chapter one to chapter two, this is about five months between the time he heard that and began to pray and he began to fast and he began to uh, turn this endeavor over to God and say, God, I know because your word told me so that you want to gather your people and if we'll be faithful, you'll bring us home. So that's my prayer. Please do that. So he begins to pray in November, December, and he gets his opportunity to go in front of the king in uh, March, April, so about five months later. And I wanna pause there for a second in the story, and we'll get to the answer to this question, but there's really an important concept here, is think about how long he persisted in prayer, and how long this stayed with him. This isn't a passing fancy like, oh, I'm so sad, I'll get over it, next week I'll forget it, and I'm off to you know the latest football standings. This is something that he had passion about. We talked about that in our last lesson. But it's also something that when he began to pray to God, he persisted in prayer. He didn't just ask once. Here's an interesting, I want to flash forward to the New Testament again. And I want to tell you something that Jesus said, because I, I want you to understand that he is a model for us. Jesus talked about this idea of prayer. And he tells a little story, a parable, in Luke chapter 18. It says, Jesus told them a parable to the effect to teach them that they ought always to pray and never give up. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who didn't fear God, he didn't respect man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and bothering him, saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he finally said to himself, look, I'm not afraid of God and I don't respect man, but this widow is wearing me out. She keeps bothering me. So I tell you what, I'm gonna give her justice so she will not beat me down by continually coming and bothering me. And the Lord said this, hear what the unrighteous judge says. He's not commending this judge for behaving in this way. What he's basically saying is simply, if a judge that cares nothing about God and cares nothing about people will be worn down by persistence. How much more will God want to answer your prayers when he loves you and wants to answer your prayers? But the question, Jesus said, is nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes, will he find faith on earth? That's an interesting little thing to tack on to the end. What's he saying? He said, if you will persist in prayer, your father wants to say yes to you. He said, but the interesting thing is, when I come, will I find people actually praying? Or will you give up? And I think this principle of Nehemiah is not only pray and align your, your will with God's will, but align your prayers with what God wants to do. The second is be persistent in prayer. 
Have you, I'm gonna go back to a lot of toddler analogies because we're in toddler 2.0 phase, as in raised our own, thought we were done, oh my goodness, grandkids, 2.0. All right, so we're going back through toddler phase, but the stakes are a lot lower. It's like, oh, sorry, we messed up with your toddler. Uh, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Uh, I'm afraid we pumped your kid full of sugar. Uh, take your kid home. You know, so it's, it's easier, I admit. But, you know, we're going through this 2.0, so you'll hear a lot of these. And, and this is really true. Your, if your children, I don't know if you guys did this, but when our kids were growing up, they wanted whatever they saw especially as it got near Christmas, right? So the whole month of November, whole month of December, in those days they looked at catalogs. As you would get all these catalogs with all these toys and every day it was something else. One time made a mistake, bought the first thing they said they wanted. That was a big mistake. By the time Christmas got there, they didn't even remember that toy existed, right? It's every day I want something new, I want something new, I want something new. And I don't know about you, but even when our kids got a little older, sometimes they would ask for something and we would say, you know, actually, I, that's, a, that's not a bad idea. But I want to find out how much you really want it. I don't mean that in a, in a harsh way. It's just like, I'm not really here to give in to your whims. You know, I can't buy you everything. So if this really means something to you, this will persist, right? I'm taking a lot of credit for things here that my wife did, but just... Just assume I did most of it, all right? But basically, you will sometimes say, I wanna see if this persists. I wanna see how serious you are about this. That's not a bad thing, that's actually a good thing, right? I, that's how I read this parable. It's God, sometimes God says, yes, I want to do this, but you know what, I wanna know how much do you wanna do this? You know, are you in on this? And so this idea of persistence in prayer, I want you to think of it in that way. I don't want you to think about, oh, I better bother God till he gives it to me. Or if I pray enough, I will have earned getting this from God. No. The idea is more God wants to give you good things. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says yes. And sometimes he says not, not yet. And some of that is just, I want to see, are you committed to this? Will you persist in prayer? Well, Nehemiah did both of those things. He committed his endeavor to God and he persisted in prayer. And if we stop this lesson right here, there's a lot to be said there. And I would really urge you, commit your endeavors in life to God. Align your agenda with his will, what he wants to do in the world, and then pray. Your father wants to say yes to your prayers and be persistent in the things that you're really passionate about. So then, what does Nehemiah do? So he goes to the king, he prays, he said, uh, he, did, he looked sad in the king's presence, and this is a risky deal. And the king said to me, why is your face set? No one's allowed to be sad in the presence of the king. I mean, it's all smiles, it's, it, you are there, and everything is focused on the king and making the king happy. Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This can't be anything but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. So he knows the king, the king trusts him, but don't get the idea that he and the king are buddies, right? This is not an egalitarian society at all. He is very much afraid, and I want you to realize what's happening here. He's afraid, why is he afraid? He is afraid because the king can fire him that would be the best thing that could happen. Throw him in jail, kill him if he wants to, but a lot of bad things can happen. And if the king just happens to be in a bad mood, you're gone and nobody's gonna plead your case. There's, there are no rights here. So he was very much afraid, but I said to the king, let the king live forever. This is what you always say to the king. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, in other words, my homeland, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed? This is an incredible little act of courage. Courage. And so I want to give you a, another element of what's going on here. And I want to talk about leadership. You notice we haven't gotten to leadership techniques yet at all. And most leadership books and most leadership courses talk about leadership techniques, and they are very good things. And you will see him doing some very important leadership techniques. But before we ever get there, 
what makes this unusual and what makes Christian leadership different than secular leadership is inviting God to control this and then the courage that it takes. This is a different paradigm of leadership. This is beyond techniques. This goes into investing yourself into your endeavors. And he is showing tremendous courage. I would argue this, that if you are leading something about which you are not passionate enough to risk anything personally, then you're not really leading something. You're kind of just marking time. I'll tell you the way it showed up for me in business. So I'll try to make this kind of short, but this was a powerful lesson to me that later when I became a Christian, I realized, ah, God already knew this. So I had a, had a job where my salary was fixed. Oh, I like that. That was nice. And then, I, a long story, really short version, I got moved into a situation where my salary was leveraged. And what I mean by that, I think commission. In other words, is you, you make more money if you do better, if you don't do very well, you don't make very much money. Well, I didn't like that very much. I thought, well, if I fail, then I really fail. And, you know, how am I gonna explain that to Laura? And so, you know, you, this, but this is the way the world works, right? You know, no risk, no reward kind of a thing. Well, after a while, I got to where, instead of not liking that, I really liked it, and here's why. I realized that the people, that don't misunderstand me if you're on salary, I'm not criticizing anyone, but here's, here's the interesting insight to me. When I was on salary, I was committed to something and I would work hard for it. But when my paycheck was on the line, I was more than committed to it. I was involved in it. I had skin in the game. I had something on the line to this. And I realized that anything that's really worth doing requires you having skin in the game one way or another. Is if you're, it's, it's not that it's a bad thing to be salaried. Please don't write me letters about that. All I'm saying is, is that the important things in life, you need to risk something. You need to invest something. And that takes courage. Is I, you know, I've said many times in business, I would make a decision. And, and there would be people who would say, well, we don't know if that's the right decision. I said, well, here's the deal. I'm betting my annual salary that it's the right decision. What are you betting on this? Well, that ended most of the arguments. It's like, well, I'm gonna get paid either way. I'm not. So I'll tell you what, why don't we do it my way? And that worked out pretty well. But the point is, that's what Nehemiah's doing. He said, I'm gonna risk my life on the whim of this man because I am so passionate for God to do what he has promised to do. Now, I'm not saying that you and your endeavors are gonna risk your life. And I'm not saying that you need to learn the same lesson I did, but I am saying this, in a marriage, in a family, in anything that really matters in life, in the ministries that you're doing, the people you care about, you need to have enough courage to put yourself on the line. Does that make sense? That's leadership. That's leadership before we ever get to the techniques of leadership. That's the essence of leadership. It's Christ-like leadership. So Nehemiah, it shows an incredible amount of courage. And so the king said to me, what are you asking, what do you want? This king's just a bottom line kind of guy. He's like, eh, I see what you're saying. What do you want? And so notice what he does. So I prayed to the God of heaven. So he's scared to death. King, you know, first thing he's thinking, king's gonna go, you're fired, get this guy out of my sight. He doesn't, he said, what do you want? And he said, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Notice, isn't that interesting that he says, some people call these arrow prayers like boing, just shot that one up, hope it hits, you know? Or air prayers like, oh Lord, help me now, right? That kind of a thing. There's nothing wrong with air prayers. You know, little short prayers in the moment are good things like, God, you see what, you see this? Yeah, this, this could be bad. Yeah, could you, I need you, you know? In fact, you can have this whole thing if you want and let me know how it works out. But this idea of he prayed to the God of heaven and he said to the king, if it pleases the king and if I found favor in your sight, please send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that's Israel, so that I may rebuild it. Well, this is interesting. He knows exactly what he wants to do. He wants to go back and he wants to rebuild the walls of the city and rebuild the city. And the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside, his, beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? 
So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. Now the Jewish sages, I can't support this from the text. The Jewish sages though believed that it was 12 years. That his answer was, I'll be gone 12 years and I'll be back. And that he came back in 12 years. But basically he says, it pleased the king to send me when I'd given him a time. And I said to the king, he's like, I'm on a roll. So he said, I said, he said, it pleases the king, give me letters to the governors of the provinces. When he says beyond the river, he means in the Middle East, right? Syria, Israel, Lebanon, that kind of thing. That they may let me pass through safely. And a letter to Asaph, whose name I have looked up, the keeper of the king's forests, so that he'll give me timber so I can rebuild. I mean, all you gotta do is sign off and all my supply problems, my supply chain issues are solved, right? He said, so I can build the gates and the fortress for the temple and the wall of the city. And the king granted me what I had asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. So I wanna pause there for a minute and I wanna talk about two interesting ideas in this. So he's prayed and aligned his, his uh, requests with God. He's committed this endeavor to God, like I cannot do this on my own. So he's prayed to God. He's shown the courage then to go act and he has prepared so that when God does act, he's ready. This is the first technique we've come to. Most people start here, prepare. There a lot happened here before we ever got to the prepare, but he is prepared, isn't he? He's thought about it. He's thought, well, if God's gonna do this, then I'm gonna need timber and I'm gonna need safe passage and I'm gonna need these things. Here's the interesting question though, and this is a question I would have for you. One of the reasons sometimes we don't prepare, we pray to God, but then we don't prepare. Uh, I'm now answering the question from this person like, I'm gonna pray to God and he'll do the preparation, right? He's gonna do everything for me. That the reason that we don't prepare, I'm gonna suggest to you it's because you don't really expect God to act. You don't really expect God to act. I'm gonna paint with a broad brush here, so I apologize to all the Presbyterians and Pentecostals in here, but I wanna give you an example of two different ideas. So there are certain Presbyterians, I'm not saying you're one of them, uh, Presbyterians, there is a kind of a little theme of deism that kind of, had, you know, in, in the past 50 years has kind of run through that denomination. And the idea of deism is simply this, there is a God and he started up the universe, but he's not really involved in an intimate day-to-day -day basis. And it's a very rational way to think about it. I, I would argue it's not an entirely biblical way to think about it, but my point is, believe in God, believe that he started things up, and when bad things happen or good things happen or whatever, it's, that's, that's just natural things happening, right? God's still God, but he's not in here micromanaging. My Pentecostal friends, everything that happens to you is God's hand in your life, okay? And I'm not trying to be facetious here. I mean, it's really a different attitude, isn't it? And my Pentecostal friends pray for everything, that God intervene here, do this, God please do that, God please do this. And my point here is not to make a commentary on these two, uh, and I'm painting with a broad brush, I admit, but I, to paint it, but to point this out to you, and you know this, right? And you and I fall somewhere in this continuum, if you will. But the interesting thing to me is that Nehemiah, if he were alive today, he'd be a Pentecostal. And the reason I think he'd be a Pentecostal is he expected God to do something. Now, he may not have expected God to do everything he wanted. I never expect God to do everything I pray for. And in fact, most of my prayers, like Jesus' prayers, this is the model for us, is, but you know what? Your will be done. Here's how I translate it. I pray for things and I go, but, if that's a big mistake, and if you know better, do your thing. Yeah, if, if what I'm asking is, oh, that's gonna be bad. Okay, you do your thing then, right? And, and we mean that, don't we? I mean, God, this is what we want, but you know best. You'll hear me say things like, you see down this road and I don't, and I know you love me. I'm good with what you decide to do, but this is my desire. That's a good prayer, it's a good way to pray. But the point is, expect God to act. And I'm not saying that you, where, I'm not telling you where exactly on this, this continuum you need to be, but we need to be more toward the side of thinking, God's gonna be acting, I just need to get on board. He is active in the world, he is doing things. Is he doing what I want? Well, no. Only to the extent that my 
desires and my agenda align with his. But he's very active in this world. He has a purpose in this world. He has a purpose for you and me. History is moving to God's purposes. I want to encourage you. You read the news and you go, man, this thing's going straight to hell. No, actually, it's not. It's actually God is sovereign even over evil things. And this plan, when we get to the end of this book, you're going to go, oh my gosh, never saw that coming. That was a happy ending. Yeah, God really does work in all things for good, Romans 8, 28. So I want you to be encouraged by that, but part of that is expecting God to act. So when you pray, prepare, because he's going to do something. And the last thing you want is pray to God. He shows up and you go, oh, I didn't do anything. I didn't think you were really going to do something here. That's the son of man. When he comes, will he find faith on earth or will it be, oh my gosh, we heard you were coming, but we never believed that. Yeah, that's not what you want to have happen, right? When God acts, you want to say, I suspected you were going to do that. I knew you were going to work in this situation. And so the idea of assume that God is going to move in your life, not just in the world period. God is at work in your life. And the extent to which we turn things over to him, we align our agenda with his purposes, show a little courage and step out like you really believe he's going to move. And God will do great things. He can do great things with us with those things. So he makes some preparation. His preparation is really interesting. He's, uh, he's obviously thought exactly what he wants. So he's got a business plan. I know exactly what I want to do. I know that I'm probably going to get killed on the way there. So I need your protection to get me there. I know when I get there, nobody around there is going to give us, sell us supplies, right? They don't want the Jews to come back into this land. They certainly don't want Jerusalem to be rebuilt. So I need something with your name on it that says, give these people what they want. So he has a plan and he lays it out before the king. Second thing that I want to talk about in this is beyond his preparation is this idea of look what he says. The good hand of my God was upon me. To whom does he give credit for how this is going? He didn't say, guess the king really liked me and guess my plan was a really good plan and aren't I slick? You know, I mean, obviously that's not his reaction. He's scared to death. Praise to God in the middle, and at least, I don't know about you, but I've done this before. I'll just admit to you. I'm like, God, this can't possibly happen, but please, please. Starts to happen, I go, oh my goodness, God, this is amazing. Thank you so much. If only it could turn out that way. It turned out that way, and the next thing you know, I'm telling my friends how, what an awesome job I did. You know, I mean, it's amazing how forgetful we can be sometimes, but I love Nehemiah because he never forgets. This isn't his deal, this is God's deal. And I love this, the, for the good hand of my God was upon me. By the way, side issue. One of the little side benefits from reading things like this in the Old Testament is you pick up phrases that you can use in your prayers. I mean, there's sometimes they just say things in ways that are beautiful ways to say things. And you're gonna see several of them in this book. And this is one that I like. The good hand of my God was upon me. That's just a neat little phrase. What is in that phrase? What does it mean? It means my God is good and he wants what's good for me. He heard my prayer. He answered my prayer and he acted in this situation. He honored my efforts. He rewarded my efforts by blessing me with what I had asked for. I mean, it's just a powerful idea and it's a beautiful little phrase. But I love it that Nehemiah... Uh, gives credit to God. And so the second step is to prepare. First is pray and devote your endeavors to God. The second is prepare, expect God to act. And I, I know last time I told you that I really wanted you to just let that soak in, the idea of committing the big things in your life, the endeavors in your life, your business, your marriage, your family, your relationships, every, commit that to God. It is incredibly freeing. And I, I really want you to think about that. If all you get out of Nehemiah is some leadership hacks, in other words, just little leadership techniques, that's good. You'll be, you'll be more effective at some things, but your life's not going to change. So the idea of committing to God and the second is prepare because you do expect God to move. That will radically change the way you live your life and the way you look at your life. Let me give you one small example of this. It's a big deal in our culture to be a victim. 
We, are, we have a culture of victimhood. Bad things happen, not my fault, I'm a victim, terrible things for me. All I wanna say about that is, that's not a very good way to live. Forget the right, the wrong, did something bad happen to you? Maybe. Uh, are you justified in saying that? Maybe, that's not my point. I'm not judging the merits, I'm just simply saying this. Nobody I know that thinks they're a victim is very happy. It just isn't the way to approach life, right? Now, if I didn't have God, I would think I was a victim because I got nothing, you know? But with God, the point is, is that ultimately you're never a victim. Ultimately, you have a lot of hope. Ultimately, you realize this isn't my life. This is God living this life, and I'm with him. You know, it's not I who live, remember Paul says, but Christ who lives in me. I mean, that's a radically different way to think about it. You go, well, then why am I bummed out? If I'm having a bad life, that's his problem. It's his life. You know, or if things aren't going well, this is God's. And you know what? He's powerful enough to actually do something about it. And then the idea of expecting God to move and saying, look, I'm not stuck. You're never stuck as a Christian. I don't care if you're in a cell or if you're in a relationship you don't see your way out of, or you're in an illness that you don't see the cure, you're never stuck. I'm not saying it's pleasant, I'm just saying you're never stuck because your God is on the move and able to move, and he will do it. You, you don't have to be a victim with Jesus Christ. Question. So how do we give God the glory for success and not sound like a prosperity gospel preacher? That's a great question. So here's the essence of the prosperity gospel. And this is why this is a very unbiblical thing. You, you cannot get this out of the Bible. The essence of the prosperity, it sounds kind of good because it uses Christian ideas and just puts them together in a way that the Bible doesn't put them together. So prosperity gospel is fundamentally, whatever sleight of hand goes around it, it basically says this. You have this commodity called faith, your trust in God, your belief in God, whatever. And you have a God that wants to do good things for you. And so if you have enough of this commodity called faith, then you can tap into God and have whatever it is you pray for, health, wealth, whatever it may be, right? The health and wealth gospel. And the whole point is, is that if you don't have those things, because surely God loves you, he wants you to be healthy and wealthy, right? Wrong, but that's the, thing, the mantra. If he really loves you, he wants you to be healthy and wealthy, right? That's not a biblical thing, but it really sounds good. I'd love to believe that, right? So, and people do. He wants you to be healthy and wealthy. Then why am I not healthy and wealthy? Don't have enough faith. How would I get more faith? Send me money. Okay, that's cynical, but that kind of is the way it goes. But the idea of a prosperity gospel is you kind of do a transaction with God. And so your faith makes kind of a claim on God. Here's the interesting thing. This is a great way to think about this. So a prosperity gospel fundamentally, once you just peel every, all the rhetoric back, because it's very persuasive. I'm not saying it's not persuasive, it's just wrong but it's persuasive. People believe wrong stuff all the time, right? I bought a car once that was wrong, 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 but it was very persuasive. I thought, oh, I'm gonna be so cool driving this car. I probably would have been had the car ever really run. But anyway, my point is that it, it, the prosperity gospel sees God kind of like the genie in the lamp. You rub the lamp and the genie pops out and says, what do you want? It's a transaction. Right, I do something and you do, and I, you, I have a claim on you. In other words, you promised this and I'm claiming this promise, you know, the claiming the promise kind of thing. You promised me health, wealth, give me every, anything I want as long as I ask, and here I am with my faith and I'm demanding it. God is really more like C.S. Lewis describes. If you remember the book, uh, Aslan the Lion is the God figure in this book. And I remember a little conversation that they're having and so, the humans talking to, um, I believe it's the, I'll get this wrong, so email me and correct me, but little beaver anyway, and saying, talking about Aslan, and said, so Aslan, he's a lion, that's scary. Oh, no, no, he's really nice. Oh, he's a safe lion. Wait a minute, says the beaver. I didn't say he was safe. I said he was good. And that's the same thing about God. Prosperity 
theology wants to take a good God and make him manageable and make him safe and make me have a claim on him. So, as you can tell, I have a definite opinion about that. But that's the essence of prosperity gospel. What is this saying? This says God's going to do his will. I'm going to align myself with his will. And his will might be that I'm not going to have everything I want. Think about the Apostle Paul. If you need a rebuttal to the prosperity theology, the Apostle Paul is calling from the grave right now. And he's saying, hey, what is up with the prosperity gospel thing? I had as much faith as anybody you know. And look at my life. You know, where are my jet airplanes? You know, where's all my money and things? It's like, no, you guys, it's not about that. It's all about my agenda became God's agenda. And for the Apostle Paul, that meant great joy. He said, I've learned to be joyful in any circumstance I'm in. Whether I've been beaten, and he was beaten a lot. Whether I've been cold, he was cold a lot. Whether I've been hungry, he was hungry a lot. Whether I'm in prison, he was in prison a lot. But the point is, he was joyful, but he didn't have a health and wealth kind of a life, did he? The point of this is, is and what Nehemiah is saying is, I'm going to align my will with yours. And Nehemiah is not going to have a cakewalk here either. But my point with that is that to simply say that giving the credit to God says, it's your will, I'm going to prepare, I'm joining you. Prosperity gospel says, I have a claim on you and you need to deliver on a promise to me. That's a very, just a very different way of thinking about God. One of those is biblical and one of those is not. I'll let you guess which. But that's just not the way God operates. He does love you. He does want to say yes to you. He does want to give you gifts. But he's not in the business of raising spoiled children. I will give you everything you want. Ever been around a child who's been given everything that they want? Yeah, it's awful, isn't it? Yeah, it's not healthy. It's not good for you. Well, God loves you too much to give you everything that you want. And instead, God is going to give you everything that you need, and he's going to do what it takes for you to be joyful in this life and absolutely exhilarated in eternity. So Nehemiah's lesson to us is to expect God to move, and that's what I really want to focus on in this lesson. The second thing he does is prepare. And the preparation isn't just a technique. Yes, it is hard work, and yes, you need to prepare. You need to plan, okay, for your family, for your marriage, for your business. You need to prepare, and you need to expect God to move in this, this situation that you're doing. It's not as much about the preparation, although that is our part of this. It's really more about what is God going to do. It's really easy to give God the glory because I realize that without God, all my preparation can't make things turn out the way I want. Things will go your way sometimes, but you can't live a life like that and try to control the world and not run up against the law of nature at some point. You are literally, it's like jumping out of the top of the tree and saying, I can defeat gravity. About two seconds later, you're going to find out how wrong you are. In life, it takes a little longer than two seconds, doesn't it? Sometimes we, we run a lot of life before we realize, actually, I'm not in control. That's why teenagers, by the way, are like they are. They really do think they're in control. They think they're immortal. They think they're omniscient. And they really do think they can make the world be the way they want it to be. And then they turn 20. And then all of a sudden, sense comes back. You know, the sense fairy comes and talks to him. But in all seriousness, expect God to move and expect God to be about his will. We join him. He doesn't join us. Make sense? Okay. So commit your endeavors to God. Prepare for what you expect and expect God to move. So next, Nehemiah makes the trip. And we're just going from one chapter to another, but this is going to take months for him to make the trip. And he gets there and he looks around and he goes, oy vey, this is worse than I thought. So I'll see you next time and we'll see what he does. <laughs>